Again, welcome to uh, our series, our first one that's going to take us through the book of Luke over the course of the next several weeks, all the way up to Easter. And in these five weeks, uh, we were at the halfway stretch of Team Jesus, five people, uh, individuals, people that Jesus called, uh, Jesus chose, Jesus uh, brought onto his team uh, 2,000 years ago. And I pray that you are blessed as we look at what we can learn from them and about our Savior and the people that were on Team Jesus as we are still today. So if you were to put a team together, what kind of qualities and characteristics would you think you'd look for that would make it well-rounded? Like every team, I think, needs someone who is, you know, focused and attention to details, right? The person who's going to make sure you stay on task, you get things done, has some organizational skills. Probably a good person to have on, on every team is Mr. Positivity. Around here at St. Peter, we call him Pastor Bill. Always happy, always uh, smiling, doesn't seem to be anything that can get him down. Uh, and this year he's super extra bubbly because Team Bengals is in the Super Bowl. And then you probably, if you're like me, you want someone on your team who can lighten the mood, someone who's funny, right? Uh, you might have that person in your life already. They, they always crack a joke. They know when to say it. They can make you smile at any time. But if I had to have my pick, just like when people ask you the question, who would be in your ultimate foursome of people? If I had someone on my team who I needed to, to be Mr. Humor, I would go with Adam Sandler. Like, I can't resist an Adam Sandler movie when I see it on USA or TNT or anything else. Like, I've seen, you know, Wedding Singer a lot. And I still think it's funny. A lot. Like Happy Gilmore, you know, uh, how can you not appreciate that movie? You know, the list could go on and on. For those of you who are a little romantic, 50 First Dates, like you ladies just love how it ends and it's an amazing story and it's kind of funny along the way. I mean, there's movie after movie. I think he's got a new one that was on Netflix with Jennifer Aniston. There's a sequel coming out, like Mystery something or other. Um, lots of people viewed it. Um, there's not much to the movies that he makes. The plot isn't like life-shattering or life-changing, but it resonates with us. It makes us smile and laugh because so much of it is kind of real. And maybe one of the lesser-known movies of Adam Sandler is one that he did called Anger Management. Anyone seen one? Yeah, Anger Management. Uh, he's in it, and Jack Nicholson's in it. Uh, Dr. Buddy, right? I think that's his name. Um, and Adam Sandler gets in trouble. He's got some anger issues, some life issues, but he gets on an airplane and he says something inappropriate, probably not extreme, but he gets tased. And then he has to go through a 30-day treatment plan with Dr. Buddy, who does some unconventional things. And it's funny. And then the end, it all works out just fine. And the happy ending happens. And, and you know, why it was so interesting and probably relatable is because we could all understand what it's like when anger is an issue. <laughs> I mean, that the reality is... That's true for each and every one of us. Anger is a human emotion. It's a neutral thing, and, and all of us have it. Jesus had it, and, and it's something that's real in our world, so we can relate to it, the ups and the downs of it when we don't manage it well, and when we do, when someone else does something that rightly causes us to feel it, and, and other times when we have no reason where it came from. Like, here's the thing I want you to, to accept today, no matter whether you think you have anger issues or not, for all of us, Big thing, big truth, we're all on Team Jesus, therefore we all have this same issue. Anger is an issue for everyone. And here's what I'm not saying at this point. It's right or wrong, it's good or bad, it's not Christian, it is Christian. Like, those are all the questions, right? Anger is an emotion, and every human being, at times, will feel it. And the answer to the questions that we really wrestle with is, should I or shouldn't I? Is anger good or bad? For a Christian, is it right or wrong? How do I know the times when it's okay and acceptable and, and times when it's not? And, and the answer to all those questions, good or bad, right or wrong, righteous or unrighteous, Christian or not Christian, is yes. Like experts would tell you, yes. There are times when anger is a healthy thing, a good thing, a normal thing. Like there are times when anger and that feeling of anger pops up because there's something that's happened in your life that you need to address and, or has taken place that you need to identify. Like some, somebody has done something to you or maybe something has happened that's putting you or someone you love in danger 
and there's anger that swells up to cause you to know there's something off. But experts would also say that feeling, sadly, all too often spills over and becomes a bad thing. And then, for us as Christians, we look at anger, we understand the realities of it, what it causes in our world, the damage that it can, it can do, but, but from a Christian perspective, there are things that I have a right to be angry about and talk about and, and address and because they're things Jesus would, right? I mean, every Christian knows, and they love the story of Jesus in the temple and the tables getting turned over because he was angry, and they use it to justify their behavior of anger. Like, Jesus got angry, I can get angry too. So being on Team Jesus means anger is not an issue all the time. It's okay and acceptable, and I can express it. And before we get into that conversation of answering that question, I first want you to to really think about why anger is an issue. Not just a general thing that all of us deal with or address, but but really think hard of of when it goes from just that feeling to to action. Because that's really the issue. See, anger in of itself isn't wrong. The Bible doesn't say so. The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. And yet, why so often for for even Christians does anger lead to sin? If you're not sure, or maybe you are, maybe you need to take notes, here are the two issues, I think, that take anger from being that normal human reaction to becoming a, a real big issue for Christians, for you and for me and people on Team Jesus. Now, the Bible says this in the book of James, Jesus' half-brother. He wrote, my brothers and sisters, take note of this. Write it down and print it on your brain. Take it to heart. Like you know when a presenter or a teacher says, take note of this, they're usually wanting you to make, uh, draw your attention and cause you to say, this is important. This is, might be essential. This is something I don't want to forget. And here's James' advice. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And that last one, he then gives a qualifier. Be slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Right up front, James tells us, when we talk about anger being an issue, we all will feel it, and it's not wrong in and of itself. The person, the thing in the mix that makes it go bad is you and me, humans. Human anger, differentiated from righteous anger, does not produce the righteousness that God desires. If you're taking notes, here's issue number one, why we need to consider and talk about anger. Human anger can flare up quickly. Human anger flares up quickly because humans are sinners. Like, sinners get angry quickly. Now, my family knows me best. People I work with who know me well, and other people in my life, I think that they would say, I'm not a person who's a, like, quick to anger person, like, there aren't many things that like cause me to just jump out of my seat, start saying words from out of nowhere because something lights the fire. Like if I asked you right down on a scale of one to 10, how, how, how much of an issue is that part of anger for you? Does it flare up quickly? Are you a, a 10 or are you a one? Now, if you identified yourself as an 8, 9, or 10, you already know that you probably have anger management issues. But for all of you who put yourself as a 5 or lower, I need you to rethink that. Just like I rethought that after Thursday night. Like, I preached this message. I'm I'm like, anger isn't like the thing that really gets the best of me all the time. Until Friday morning. Like, I went to the gym, the Y in Greenville. I'm coming home around 6.50 a.m., and I'm driving down Highway 76, and I'm getting ready to turn on Wisconsin to go back towards my house. 
And I'm going about 47 miles an hour, sorry to the police officers, I know the speed limit there is 45, but you get grace like 10% over, somewhere in there. Um, and I get close enough to this car where I have to slow down a little bit, and, and they start slowing down on me really big time, leading all the way up to Wisconsin Avenue to the point they got down to 30 miles an hour and the light is green ahead of me and I know that light changes really quickly and it's a long light and I want to turn and then I knew what they were doing. They were slow rolling me up to the stoplight to make me catch the light so I couldn't turn. Like I can get my car from zero to 60 pretty fast but I got from zero to 100 on the anger level really fast and something came out of my mouth or muttered under my breath about that person and I showed them I got through that light. And I stayed behind them all the way till I had to turn and they knew I was there. How did I get from zero to a hundred on that anger level over getting home 10 seconds sooner? And I thought about the sermon. Like it can flare up quickly. Just so dangerous. Like for some people it's driving, for some people it's the internet. For some people, it's that conversation. For some people, it's that person. For some people, it's that thing, but it'll light the fuse really quickly. And that's what human anger does. It flares up quickly. You can quote Jesus, turn the tables in the temple, but my guess is Jesus thought long and hard and prayerfully about what was happening in that moment and the why behind the what of that moment. And if you don't recognize that issue, that it can flare up quickly, when it does, you'll be in no position to manage it well. Because here's the thing about human anger, it rolls over into unrighteous actions. The book of Proverbs kind of gives us the why behind that what. For as churning cream produces butter, as twisting the nose produces blood, so stirring up anger produces strife. Anger that flares up quickly, human anger, turns into this. Unhealthy human anger. And unhealthy human anger will blow up blessings. It will blow them up. Like, just think about relationships and what unhealthy human anger does to them. Like, that person does that thing, and you lash out in that way with those words and call them names. It will destroy that relationship. Or think about your job. Or think about that person that you know at your job who, whose anger got the best of them and it led them down a path that got them fired. Or what about your marriage? Or maybe you already know because you have someone you call an ex because anger was an issue. It flared up quickly and sometimes inspired fists to fly. And you took the brunt of it. Like unhealthy human anger will blow up blessings. And not just worldly ones, spiritual ones. You know that a lot of people who don't call themselves Christian right now or want nothing to do with the church look at Christians and go, you guys have issues. Call people names. You lash out with, in violence in external ways that is destructive. Like, I don't associate any of you with things that transpired on January 6th. I don't associate lots of people with other events that transpired on streets, but over the course of the last year, you've seen a lot of people who, who've been righteous, the angry, maybe over issues in our world that spill over into physical violence. And you know, some of the people who've done that have been, say they do it in the name of God. Or I think about in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, when Christians began to protest abortion clinics, then chain themselves to doors because they loved life and they knew God loved life and they believed it was the righteous thing to do and then it compelled some of them to go so far to blow up buildings with human lives in it. 
That's unhealthy human anger. And not only does it affect relationships this side of heaven, our lives and blessings, it can undermine opportunities that God has to, to pass along spiritual ones to others. And so when I say all those things, as you wrestle with maybe the things you've done in anger, the damage it's caused, you have to wonder, what place would a person who needs anger management treatment, like Pastor Tim, obviously, as he just confessed, have doing on God's team? Well, here's the thing. God chose two people to be a part of his group of 12 who had anger issues. Like the percentage was higher than the norm. Experts say about 8% of Americans have anger management issues, like negative anger issues that spill over in their life. That's a low number in your mind until you do the math. At, at 922 Ministries, that would be over 200 plus people in our church who have anger issues that are really bad. And Jesus chose two to be in his 12 and 66% of his inner circle of three. <laughs> the names James and John might ring a bell because they were closest to Jesus and some of you even know their nickname that Jesus gave them. It's recorded in scriptures. They were known as the sons of thunder. Like, you know what thunder does to your animals when they hear it? They jump, they hide. <laughs> you know what thunder does to you when you hear it? You turn. Like, it's a loud noise. James and John brought the hammer. They were the sons of thunder. They had anger <laughs> a lot of times. And what we're going to see in just a second is revealing, A, because on Jesus' team, he had people with anger issues. But even more importantly is what I want you to see, how Jesus responded to it and how Jesus responded to them and how he would have us maybe consider the issues that we just talked about, that it flares up quickly, that it can blow up blessings and, and how God would have us understand better the solution so that anger does not become an obstacle to the gospel, doesn't destroy those blessings and affect our life or our opportunities to reach people. And so it's a simple section from Luke chapter 9 where we see James and John, members of Jesus' team, in action. Now, before I get into the text and read through a few verses, and I'm going to throw them up on the screen right now, chapter 9 is an amazing chapter in the Gospel of Luke. It starts with Jesus sending out the 12, and, and I, I tell you that because the context matters. He sends them out, he sends them with nothing, he sends them with tips, and he sends them with this final bit of advice right before they go. If you go into a city and they reject you, they say no, shake the dust off your sandals and walk to the next city. Okay? So this isn't that far removed from the story we're about to hear. It's only a chapter earlier. Then along the way, Jesus has performed amazing miracles. He's, he stopped and helped people, healed people, fed 5,000 people. James, John, and Peter were actually involved in the transfiguration just a few verses before that. They saw Jesus in all his glory opportunity that caused them to go to their feet because it was so bright and so brilliant. So they knew who he was. They saw something no one else had seen. And then right before this section, verses 49 and 50, the disciples are having an argument. They're debating who's the greatest and will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, part of me in my mind, even though I wasn't at the table, tells me that there were three people around the group who thought they were greater than the other t nine. And if there's something to be said, we already talked about Peter, and now we know James and John are the sons of thunder. Like, Peter's the, the verbal vomiter, and James and John bring the hammer. Like, who do you think was inspiring and starting the conversation and finishing it with the last word? And then there's this. At that time, as the time approached for him to be taken into heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. We have a turn in direction. The rest of the Gospel of Luke is going to be a long journey of Jesus at different stops all along the way to the ultimate destination, his death. And there's a whole lot to unpack in that verse. In fact, I could preach a whole sermon on that, and I will the first week of Lent, Ash Wednesday. So I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. But understand that Team Jesus was on their way to Jerusalem, and yet Team Jesus was going to take a detour and do a, a road show in Samaria, which would not be expected. Jesus sent messengers ahead of him while he was on the way to Jerusalem, went off course like no Jew would do, 
into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. Most people think, based on the, the text, it was James and John. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. The Jews and the Samaritans had different uh, backgrounds, different genetics, and different worship lives. The, the Jews looked down on the Samaritans for their genetics because they were half-bred. They were a mixture of all the different people that had been brought in over all the different times when they had been taken captive. And they weren't pure from a bloodline standpoint, and they were impure from a worship standpoint. The Samaritans believed their worship in Samaria was just as good as worship in Jerusalem. Your God is just the same as our God. Our worship here is, is fine. And the Jews would say, no, it has to be Jerusalem. And Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem for that worship, made a detour into their worship, which maybe wouldn't shock you when what they got was a no. But I want you to put yourself in the shoes of James and John and Peter and the rest of the disciples, whoever it was that got the cold shoulder. Like you spent time with Jesus. You just saw Jesus transfigured. You've seen him feed 5,000. You've seen him raise the dead, change water into wine. Like you've seen Jesus do amazing things, a miracle after miracle, impressive message after impressive message. You've seen hearts changed. Like you know, and you go to the city and you give your best pitch, like the the slow pitch, softball, home run ball that's going to get knocked out of the park. Compelling case, you should see Emmanuel. He has come down and this is the guy. And you get the door slammed in your face. Like if that's you and you're on Team Jesus, you have this great thing to offer and you've just offered it. What's burning in your heart when they say no? Well, here's what was burning in James and John's heart. James and John, uh, when not welcomed, responded with this. Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? It went from Emmanuel's coming to town to Jesus, do you want us to scorch them from above? Like that. And before I judge James and John, sometimes my righteous anger and some things that really break my heart that burn me up, like some of the things that are done to people in this life by ungodly people, I sometimes wish and think, if only God would step in and do something about that. Like if God would end their time of grace right now so they don't get a chance at that. Do you know what that is a result of? This. See, the truth is, what James and John were wrestling with, the sons of thunder, the bring the hammer, it wasn't about God and it wasn't about Jesus. It wasn't about righteous anger. It was about, if you're filling in the blanks, which anger almost always is, ego. Like human anger is, is ego almost always. Our anger like there are very rare few times when our anger gets to be qualified as righteous. It might start as righteous, but the lashing out, the name calling, the bitterness we hold on to, the revenge we desire, so sadly all too often spills over. And, and please don't hear me wrong. There are things that may have happened to you in your life that you have a right to be angry about. Like if someone betrayed a trust, if, if someone has maligned your name and it's cost you a lot, if, if someone in anger has lashed out against you, verbalized, abused you physically or any way, I do not want to minimize that one bit. But even in times like that, when that anger is righteous, the human heart that's so quick to lash out can lead someone who, who rightly so is angry to a place of ego and revenge seeking. I want them to pay. I want them to get theirs. And here's what I know about Jesus and being on his team. Ego has no place. Like think about Jesus and his ego. 
I mean, he didn't, he didn't just knock the people over and kill them when his hometown wanted to stone him and was threatening to throw him off the cliff. No, instead, he, he walked away and left them unscathed. Or think about Jesus as he's looking over Jerusalem as Holy Week begins. And he knows those voices that are praising are going to quickly turn into voices that are shouting crucify, and yet he weeps because his heart breaks because they've rejected. Or think about on the cross as people are, are calling him out and saying, prove it, prove it. Like how many times in your anger haven't you lashed back? Oh, I'll prove it. Jesus instead doesn't come down. He just lowers his head and, and says, Father, forgive. And instead, Jesus endured the anger and wrath of God so that you and I might not spend eternity in hell for our anger issues that are almost always about ego. I know better. I'm right. You're wrong. How dare you? You've hurt me. So what does that mean for people on the team who wrestle with ego and struggle with anger? First, I want you to see Jesus, the one who never put himself first. Here's what he did. Jesus turned and rebuked them. He rebuked them. Didn't accept it. He didn't tolerate it. He, he called it what it was. He called it wrong. In your anger, you are sinning. He rebuked them, but he didn't run from them. He corrected them, but he didn't kick them out. Like he, he didn't cancel them off of the team or tell them they were no longer in the circle. He addressed the issue. He knew why it was such an issue. Like these two individuals are going to play a vital and important role in the church going forward. And the message of God and Jesus Christ and the cross is not anger and vengeance and repayment and me first. It is you first and it is sacrifice and it is mercy. He didn't kick them out. He called them to keep going. And they went to another village. Like he modeled for them what he longed for them to do, what he had done and what he had told them to do. Shake the dust off your feet instead of calling down fire from heaven. Because you know why? God wants all people to be saved. And maybe those Samaritans at this time were not ready for Jesus, were not ready for that message, were unwilling to, to let people into their city but you know who Jesus included in his final encouragement to those very disciples before he went back to heaven after accomplishing the mission? He said, preach that message first in Jerusalem, then in Judea. And you know what the next circle and layer is? Samaria. And then to the ends of the world. Like Jesus specifically before he leaves says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, that place, you were there. You know what happened there. Go there. Tell them about me. Share the message. Tell them of the cross, of the mercy and love of God. Don't be mad. Don't let anger drive you. When anger flares up, don't let it spill over and, and become unrighteous behavior. And instead, Jesus' solution, when anger is an issue, being on his team, he says this, don't be mad, be merciful. Don't be mad, be merciful. Because that's who God is. That's what being on his team is all about. I'm not saying there aren't consequences to sin when, when there are things that make you rightly angry and people do things that break the heart of God in this life when there are punishments that, that they have to face. That's a reality, but, but anger that allows us to hold on to it, seeks vengeance, lashes out, has no place on Team Jesus. And, and James and John got it. They knew it. They learned from it. They knew Jesus' solution was mercy, not anger. 
because they knew that was better than being bitter. And there was someone else who knew that, who kind of gives us insight into that solution. How can we do that? Be merciful. Why? Don't be mad. Paul would maybe have been the poster child of anger issues in his early years. Like Paul was formerly Saul, he was the one holding the coats, celebrating the stoning of Stephen. And yet Paul later understood the love and mercy of God that was shown to him. And so he compelled and encouraged Christians, do this instead. Here's his words in Ephesians chapter 4. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Like, I don't know how you trigger your brain, but here's a way. When you feel the anger bubble up, some experts say, stop and pause and give yourself one thing to say you are thankful for. Change direction. It's that simple. Like, maybe the next time that person uh, isn't going fast enough for you, Pastor Tim, at 6.50 in the morning because you have nothing else to do on your day off Friday, you might be thankful that you have a car that works. And if you have to sit at the stoplight, okay. Get rid of those things. They're only going to take you to bad places and do damage to the blessings of God. Instead, here's God's solution, kindness. You first, compassion, mercy, and be those things to each other. Forgive each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Go to the cross, see the wrath of God on his son, hear your Savior Jesus say, forgive them, and celebrate you're forgiven. Mercy. And it's what I love about the story of John. At the foot of the cross, months later, when Jesus finally made it there, Jesus looked him in the eye and said to the disciple whom he loved, take care of my mom. And John's gospel, which was the last one written, you know one of the most amazing stories in that gospel that John was inspired to record? When Jesus went to Samaria and found a woman by a well, who was a train wreck of a person who God had every right maybe to be angry at, but Jesus loved her and shared the word with her, and many came to faith. John got it. And John, inspired to write his gospel, said, here's the ultimate truth. We love because he first loved us. John chapter 1, 1 John is filled with these words, but whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. In this world, the last phrase, we are like Jesus. Like, anger will blow up blessings, but it will blow up the spiritual ones. Limit your opportunities. And and John knew it, and John got it. And his advice to you and me, me, people on the team, don't be mad, be merciful. Yes, there's even a place on the team for people who wrestle with anger. And it might be your issue. Thanks be to God that through Jesus we have the solution And we have peace because of his sacrifice for our sins. Come back next week as we we look at another story of one more disciple. Just like James and John wasn't worthy to be on the team, but was blessed like we are. Let's pray for that. Heavenly Father, it's scary to think how quickly my anger can flare up. And I celebrate how yours never did, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for for keeping my anger in the times when it could have blown so many things up in check and for forgiveness when it, it did things that were hurtful. That's my prayer for everybody here, Lord. Our anger has been an issue. We've hurt people that we've loved. We haven't been merciful to people who need your love. And James and John wanted fire from heaven instead of another opportunity And Lord, there are people in our world who who want nothing to do with you right now, but Lord, we want another opportunity. So we're not calling for fire from heaven. Don't let us be mad. Let us show mercy. Work on our hearts. If anger is our issue, Lord, help us address it. And let us begin with, just as in Christ, we have been forgiven. You call us to forgive others. Lord, help us be merciful so that others like James and John understood later in ministry they might see the mercy of God and no love.